Good morning, and welcome to this fantastic event, Accelerating the Circular Economy from Global Lessons to Local Perspectives. I look forward to sharing the next hour with you. While we, while we wait a few minutes for people to log on, you're welcome to start engaging with our interactive tools. On the right of the screen, you will see three tabs, a tab to chat, a tab to submit a question in the Q&A, and a tab for our polling. And I invite you to use these tools throughout the event. My name is Claire Ferris-Miles, and I'm the CEO of Sustainability Victoria, and have the pleasure of being your host today. I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri Wauraronk people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and their enduring connection to this land over the past 60,000 years and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Today, I welcome three speakers. The Honourable Lily D'Ambrosio, Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change and Minister for Solar Homes. Veronica de la Cerde, Partner and Corporate CEO of Tricyclos, who is joining us from Chile, and Katie Barfield, Founder and CEO of Yumi Food Australia. I also want to acknowledge members of the Sustainability Victoria Board and our expert advisory group who are also joining the event today. We are all here today because the time is now to ignite a circular movement, a circular economy in Victoria. And I welcome everyone joining us today who are starting in this transition. Perhaps you are well on your way, or you may even be well advanced in your circular economy journey. There is much for us to learn from each other. We want this event to be as interactive as possible and to the right of the video feed on your screen, you will see the three tabs I mentioned earlier, the polling tab, Q&A and chat functions. You can use the chat function throughout the event to share comments and thoughts on the discussion. Please feel free to introduce yourself and your organisation or the project that you're working on. The Q&A function is where you can submit and like questions, which will be for our panel discussion later on in the hour and make sure to mention which speaker your question is for. And finally is the polling function. Our first poll is now live with the question, what level of knowledge or experience do you have with the circular economy? And you can click on the polling tab now to submit a response. As we progress through the morning, I'll keep you updated as the new polls go live. Our first speaker is the Honourable Lily D'Ambrosio, who is going to share with us the bold vision of the Victorian government to create a new economy, a circular economy. Over to you, Minister. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Claire, for your welcome. Uh, and it is great uh, to be here, of course, uh, with you, with uh, Veronica, with Katie. Uh, and this is a terrific way to kick off Vic Goes Circular. Uh, and I would like to, though, begin by acknowledging formally the traditional owners of the land on which uh, I am located, and that is the land of the Wurundjeri people. And my respects go to all elders, past, present and emerging, and any who may be here uh, amongst all of us uh, right across the country and, and beyond. Uh, and certainly this year, 2020, uh, hasn't been uh, the year that any one of us really expected, and whilst it's had its uh, significant challenges and continues to, uh, Victorians have shown uh, kindness and resilience, ingenuity and resourcefulness. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you would agree they are all very admirable traits uh, for us to have uh, we, when we are confronted with some significant challenges. Uh, we've all had to adapt, we've all had to collaborate and we've had to innovate. And it's these qualities which uh, Victorians have in abundance and uh, that we must now, of course, harness uh, as we shift our focus to accelerating our circular economy. Uh, back in February of this year, we launched the Victorian government's Recycling Victoria, a new economy action plan. Uh, and that action plan contains an investment of more than $300 million to drive the state towards a circular economy. 
This is a once in a generation transformational change, one that involves all Victorians, including households, local government, business and industry and community organisations. And I'm delighted to be here today to one, launch the Circular Economy Business Innovation Centre and two, to open the first rounds of funding for business because together we will transition to a circular economy. To help this transition, we've set ambitious targets for the next 10 years. How we make, how we use, recycle and manage everyday products is going to change. We aim to cut waste generation by 15% and to divert 80% of waste from landfill. We also aim to halve the amount of organic material going to landfill. Our new economy will turn what we currently consider waste into value, create local industries, potentially boosting our economy by up to $6.7 billion, and see world-class infrastructure and technology built here in Victoria. It will also support the creation of more than 3,900 new local jobs. By 2040, Recycling Victoria will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by up to 19.4 million tonnes. We can't make this change without also supporting a business-led transition. We're doing this through our $7 million Circular Economy Business Innovation Centre. The Circular Economy Business Innovation Centre, or CBIC, as we are going to call it from here on, uh, will equip Vic Victorian businesses with the support that you've asked for to allow you to take advantage of circular economy business opportunities. We've called it a centre because CBIC will provide research and resources. It will facilitate collaboration. It will host events and it will offer grants and support for businesses. The centre will find out what works in Victoria when moving to a circular economy and share this knowledge widely so others can adopt early successes. Best of all, it is underpinned by a virtual hub, which will continue to grow and develop. But CBIC isn't just for business. It's about bringing businesses together with industry groups, research institutions, and not-for-profit organisations, with the aim to create an opportunity for innovation and collaboration across supply chains, and to leverage Victoria's design and engineering expertise. From an operational perspective, the first focus area of the centre will be food and organics. And CBIC's activities will be supported by an expert advisory group, including, of course, Katie Barfield, founder and CEO of Yumi Food, who is here with us today. To mark the launch of the centre, I am further delighted to be opening the first round of the $10 million Recycling Victoria Business Support Fund. This funding will enable businesses, industry groups and not-for-profit organisations to identify and implement circular economy opportunities and approaches. Additionally, round one of the $2.9 million Recycling Victoria Innovation Fund is also open. These grants will support collaborative partnerships to implement circular economy opportunities and apply and scale up circular economy business models and practices. So through Recycling Victoria, we are leading our state towards a prosperous circular economy, turning our waste into a valuable commodity. This 10-year $300 million overhaul of recycling, waste management and resource use will ensure smart, clean economic growth. It will deliver more jobs, more value, more opportunity and a cleaner, safer environment for Victorians. We're supporting councils, businesses and households to change not only our approach to waste, but how we make, use and manage the items we rely on every day. And CBIC will play an integral role in achieving this. So today I ask you all to be inspired and energised by the opportunities and support launched here today. Reflect on your own business model, supply chain and network and think outside the square because together we can deliver more jobs, more value, more opportunity, and a cleaner, safer environment for Victorians. So I look forward uh, to answering any questions during the panel discussion. So please submit your questions via the Q&A function. Thank you, each and every one of you. Thank you, Minister. 
And um, thank you for inspiring us and officially launching CBIC. We always love a good acronym <laughs> in <laughs> government. So CBIC is the newest one. Um, and Sustainability Victoria is very excited to be leading delivery of this incredible initiative. Um, as the minister mentioned, if you love hashtag um, for this event, we've got the hashtag uh, Vic Goes Circular. So please on your social channels to promote the event and to promote the launch of CBIC and the minister just opening two rounds um, of fantastic grants to support all Victorian business to accelerate their circular economy transition. As the Minister said, if you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A uh, tab on the right of your video feed. And um, I can just announce the results of our first poll are in. The results are showing that 42% of you are pretty familiar with what a circular economy is. 13% um, are an expert. Well done to all our experts on the, on the uh, call. 7% um, are new. And there's no one on our call today that doesn't know what circular means. So um, it's great to have a diversity. And I think um, what you'll hear from Veronica and Katie today is we're all on different stages of the circular transition. And, th and that's fantastic about how do we support each other. And today's event is opportunities to accelerate our thinking and accelerate our business models. Our next speaker is joining us all the way from Chile. And so I'm going to open our second poll. Where are you joining us from? So please submit your answer. Our second speaker is Veronica de la Cerde, partner and corporate CEO of Triciclos, a Chilean certified B Corporation with operations throughout Latin America. Triciclos are committed to designing and implementing solutions for a circular economy. Welcome, Veronica. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you, uh, all of you, for inviting me here. I'm very honored to be participating in this launch. I, I would like that funding for ourselves as well. So <laughs> sounds very interesting. Is it possible for me to apply? Um, but uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm truly honored to be here and share with you some of what we've what we've been doing here in Triciclos. Uh, we've been working, as Claire mentioned, to implement circular economy solutions, uh, helping not only the private sector, but actually as well the, the public sector, creating the not only the infrastructure, but also the incentives and the conditions that will allow us right, to move from a linear economy to a more sustainable circular economy. So let me begin explaining a, a bit about what we do how we started and then what we learned through these years. We started more than a decade ago with a very clear pur purpose here in Triciclos. We only wanted to eliminate the generation of waste. That's simple and of course not very easy. And we've been doing so here in Chile, where I'm located, and in many other countries in Latin America. Considering that back then here in Chile and in many other countries, there weren't any EPR systems. So there was no systems that actually manage the recyclable wastes here in Latin America. We started with a downstream approach. What could we do to help divert those waste streams from landfills or even nature towards a more sustainable end? We implemented these pre-recycling stations located in commercial and public spaces where people could bring their own recyclables, separate them in these spaces uh, in all the different categories. So then our team could send them directly to the different uh, recycling plants that, we, that could here in Chile actually process them. We quickly expanded throughout Chile. We also moved to Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica. We're starting now in Mexico as well. And hopefully uh, growing further, further north, managing now the biggest uh, recycling station network in Latin America. We have sent more than 40,000 metric tons of materials to recycling plants that otherwise would have ended up in landfills in the best case scenario. But the main purpose of these stations was not to create, was, was more than just receiving materials. It was actually to create a conversation with consumers, helping them understand the impacts of their consumption habits while they'll separate the materials and as well as learn how could they consume differently and better, of course. We are a big corporation, just as Claire mentioned. Um, so the social aspect of what we do is very important. 
Um, th so, so these stations were also designed to be managed by former waste pickers, giving them a secure space, promoting the formality of their work and highlighting the contribution they can give to our society after decades of experience in this field. In this downstream approach, we also have worked with public sector, not only operating pre-recycling stations actually from them, but also helping local authorities design inclusive and comprehensive recycling waste, recyclable waste management solutions for their territories and connecting better with their citizens in order to promote sustainable habits among them. We've encountered many difficulties and this year, just as the minister mentioned, was a very difficult one. Uh, COVID-19 forced us uh, to close all of our recycling, recycling stations in order to control the pandemic. So we were forced to innovate, innovate fast. We couldn't allow all those materials to end up in landfills. Uh, so we acceler accelerated the creation of a digital platform and app, which allow us to make the stations secure places by controlling access and guaranteeing the sanitary conditions necessary to control the contagion. But this also presented an opportunity of digitalizing the educational component of this station. So that part that for us was super important, we could now do it through this digital solution, providing it right through the app. Now we have thousands of users, we are adding new features to this app, like the, some of them already already developed by ourselves, which is a recyclability index for packaging and also giving people access to a circular marketplace, all designed to help users consume better. But in Triciclos, we believe waste is a design error. So it is precisely in the designing process where the biggest part of the solution relies on. So in parallel to all this recyclable waste management business, very focused on consumers, we started helping companies to design out waste. We provide them with digital solutions to control and improve the recyclability of their packaging and also measure the impacts of their products along the entire value chain, like life cycles analysis, for example, etc. And through, the, through other innovation-led processes, we help them question their own business models to make them more circular, hopefully moving away even from recycling and stepping into all other layers of circularity. We indeed are moving ahead with a joint venture precisely dedicated to a refillable solution for home care products that started as a, as a consulting project that we helped this company uh, improve in their packaging. And now they are moving to a chain of stores for refillable solutions through their own products. We're also helping the delivery industry trying to uh, put in place a, a returnable packing, packaging approach starting from the food delivery in order to reduce the amount of waste generated through single use packaging in this industry that is growing and growing, right? Very important now in, in COVID. Uh, we also know that there are many other barriers to implement circularity and the minister mentioned them. So you need not only innovation, you need collaboration. You need collaboration through the entire value chain of products and also with the public sector to really be able to close the loop of certain materials. As active participants and promoters of the new plastics economy initiative, for example, from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we managed to gather key stakeholders of the plastic value chain here in Chile around the NPEX principles, which led to the first plastic pact here in Latin America, aimed to commit those companies and government to build a sustainable plastic industry and solve the problems caused by plastic waste. We are starting the same process in Brazil, Colombia, and hopefully soon in Argentina. We're also part of the strategic committee for the Chilean roadmap towards a circular economy laid, led right, for, for, uh, by the Chilean government, because this is a complex problem to be solved. So we need everyone aligned and on board. Triciclos and many others, just as Victoria and others here, are working very hard, right? But of course, this is not enough. Just to give you some data, we recently collaborated as experts in the study uh, that was released a couple of months ago called Breaking the Plastic Wave from the Pew Charitable Trust and Systemic. And we learned that with all current commitments, there are not few, uh, we will only reduce 7% of annual plastic flows that are going through the ocean, to the ocean. This is one proof that we're definitely not solving this issue yet. We need to pull up that ambition 
We need radical collaboration. And also we need innovation, but meaningful innovation. We need out of the box, socially conscious ideas from all parts of the world, especially the Southern part of it. We need to put the consumer or user, hopefully, in the center of the solution. And only by doing so, we will be in the right track to put a circular economy in practice and solve this design error that is waste. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. That was that was just incredibly inspiring. And that was three key takeaways I took from your, your uh, address. Waste is a design error. I think that's a fantastic um, thing for us all to think about a, a design led circular economy. I love the idea of radical collaboration um, across the whole value chain and meaningful innovation, you know, meaningful that it achieves an outcome that we work together to really start to solve some of these incredible um, dilemmas and design challenges that we have across the value change. Um, so thank you so much for um, your inspiration um, for us today. Now, um, I think we might have the results of the poll in terms of whether they've come in. Uh, so I think I'm seeing that a lot of people here, oh, a lot of people here from Metro Melbourne, which is uh, great. Um, and also welcome all of our regional Victoria, which is we love, read, we are not um, metro centric. We absolutely love everyone that lives in the state of Victoria. Um, and also exciting to see so many people across Australia um, and our overseas colleagues as well. So thank you for joining us today. Now we're gonna to transition to a panel discussion. And um, I see many of you are submitting your questions through our Q and A function. Um, I encourage you to continue to do that and to like questions um, that you agree with. And um, I'll, I'll be looking at that as we go through the panel discussion. Um, I'll welcome back on the screen, the Honourable Minister D'Ambrosio and Veronica, together with our very own local circular hero, Katie Barfield. <laughs> Katie will be known to many of you. She was the founding CEO of Second Bite in 2012. And then in 2015, created Yumi Food Australia, Australia's first surplus food online marketplace. As CEO of Yumi Food Australia, she is leading the charge in preventing food waste and returning millions of dollars to Australian farmers and manufacturers. And as the minister just announced, uh, Katie is also one of the founding members of the Circular Economy Business Innovation Centre's expert advisory group. So Katie, to kickstart our panel discussion, circularity is at the heart of your business, Yumi Foods Australia. What lessons have you learned about having a circular mindset as your business has grown and evolved? Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm so inspired this morning. What a way to start a Friday morning. Um, Look, it's interesting because circular economy wasn't, was a catchphrase that wasn't even in the vernacular when I started out sort of 14, 15 years ago. And it's so exciting to hear all these amazing catchphrases now that roll off the tongue like radical innovation, which I too wrote down. Um, but what I saw initially was I really saw, I saw waste, I saw inefficiency, I saw, you know, damaging environmental practices. But I think more than anything, I just saw an opportunity. You know, in us in, here in Victoria, there's 2.4 million tonnes of food that goes to waste every single year. That's the equivalent of about 250 semi-trailers of food that go to waste every day. And that is a $6 billion opportunity. So one of my favourite things about the circular economy is that you can actually do well and do good. You know, we can make financially viable business practice whilst also making sound environmental choices. Um, but I think you asked me what was one of the things that I've learned on this journey. And um, this might sound bizarre, but one of the major things I've learned is that um, a quick no is a good no. So by that, I mean, I have, you know, even though our, our proposition at Yumi is very, very compelling, you've got to remember that not everybody will be ready to hear your message. And so my, my message to everyone is don't be discouraged by that. You know, we have spent time knocking on the doors of companies where we can see we can make a massive difference. We've seen the waste reports. We know how we can commercialize that. We can move that food further up the food waste hierarchy. But sometimes people are just not ready to hear your message. So don't burn the energy and the time and the resources. Move on because there will be plenty of people who are ready to hear your message. So don't lose faith. This is incredible 
incredibly exciting to be part of CVIC and um, to see Victoria really, really leading the charge and that Minister Ambrosio is behind us all the way. It's just fabulous. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, so the minister, uh, as, as Veronica said, I think she wants to uh, become a Victorian all the way from Chile in terms of the incredible opportunities that the Victorian government is, is um, creating. Is uh, Recycling Victoria obviously has, is bold and has very ambitious targets. Um, what do you see the role of sort of the business community to contribute to achieving these targets? Well, the role of uh, business uh, and industry is really at the centre of uh, us achieving our goals. Uh, when, when you have a think about it, um, you know, if we've got a, a target of uh, reducing or cutting back on our waste generation by 15% per capita in 20, by 30, 2030, you have to think about all of the ways that each of us as consumers in Victoria in, interact and are part of the creation of waste. Uh, and, and, and certainly, uh, businesses are at the heart of making it easier and as easy as possible uh, for Victorian consumers to actually make the right choices and make the right decisions. And so we know, of course, businesses themselves um, uh, uh, all, all throughout uh, uh, the, the variety of ways that businesses are involved in the economy, dem uh, construction, demolition uh, activities, uh, businesses, industry, manufacturers, uh, collectively, they generate about 80% uh, of the total amount of waste that's generated in Victoria. So that of itself uh, rings the bells and says, well, you know, that, that's an obvious area uh, for major uplift and, and major change uh, towards meeting our targets. So if we're able to help uh, those businesses improve uh, efficiency, uh, they can avoid a lot more waste and help to achieve uh, our targets. Uh, but businesses can also help to influence, of course, um, the amount of waste that is generated by households. Uh, and, and that can go to the issues like, you know, uh, designing out your errors, as, as, uh, as Veronica uh, labelled it, uh, in terms of design of products and the services that are provided. <clears throat> so being more clever in the way that designs are by building in uh, a reduction of waste and the principles of uh, reuse uh, and recycling uh, will go such a long way to actually meeting uh, our targets. So designing, selling products that uh, last longer can be reused uh, and repaired uh, and by reducing packaging and packaging is one of those massive contributors to uh, plastics that end up in our environment. Uh, they All of those approaches can really help uh, consumers who really by and large do want to do the right thing and do want to be part of the solution, it will make it far easier for them uh, to help us meet those targets. And, may, and, and all of us uh, demonstrating by real examples and in intangible ways, how we can all collaborate to get those targets and get that uh, reduction uh, in waste and, and really moving to that circular economy. Thank you, Minister. Uh, a question for you, Veronica. Um, and it's great to get insights and the title of event today is really about translating uh, global, you know, exemplars to local perspectives and given we have so many people on the call from Victoria, I'm sure they'd be incredibly interested to know, um, you know, what are the industries or sectors in Latin America that are leading the adoption of innovative circular business models? Hi, oh, Claire, it's a tough question because we're not necessarily doing very good in a general perspective right and and i have to say that probably the ones that are leading the process are multinationals that are committed to a lot of things that are way much ambitious that what our governments are actually asking those companies to achieve so as sad as that makes me um i would have to say that those industries or i mean those companies are the ones leading you have uh, the Coca-Colas, the Walmarts, the Unilevers that actually are, are, a, uh, are key players in the circular economy, right? Because as, uh, as the minister mentioned, packaging is a huge contributor to the problems of this linear economy in terms of plastic pollution and waste in general. Um, 
So unfortunately, yes, we have that um, uh, that lack, that, that gap, right, between what the multinationals and the local companies are doing. But of course, we have some uh, some companies moving moving ahead. So we have here here in Chile and also in in Brazil, we have come out with a lot of companies uh, trying to move. And this is probably the 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 ones that we've encountered the most uh, are in the consumer goods. So we work a lot with, for example, Natura, which is a com cosmetic company in Brazil that was born very sustainable. Um, and, and, and now, of course, has a lot, a lot to do with uh, moving towards uh, a circular economy. He's doing a lot of things uh, among those lines. Uh, so consumer goods are probably the ones that are moving more, more quickly. But then um, we are starting to see some innovations in fashion, which is very important because as well is a, a, a very important contributor to uh, the problems of waste. And uh, we are seeing um, new and very interesting moves in agriculture too. So when, when you're talking about circular economy, we tend to focus a lot on the technical aspect of circular economy, which are like materials, right? Uh, metals, plastics, etc. But then you have all this other part, with, with, which is the organic part, right? Of all that we actually consume. Um, or, in, or, or even you use in other ways. Um, so we're seeing um, regeneration as a concept that is starting to uh, get a bit more, I don't know, action, uh, because we, we not only need to tackle this problem and avoid or, or, or reduce the negative impacts that we're, generation, we're generating over the environment, but actually we need to create positive value, right? We need to create, we re regenerate our soil and, and, and our environment because the problems of the climate crisis are huge. Um, so it's, it's, we have little time for that. So probably there in those two sectors, you have new things coming up and the ones that should be probably moving much faster are mining sector, very important for Australia as well as for Chile and the construction sector as well. You have a huge, a huge uh, problem there. So those two sectors should be start moving faster than they are now. Thank you so much, Veronica. Uh, I'm now gonna divert to some of the questions that those of you have asked, uh, have asked for the panel. Um, the first one I, I'm gonna possibly take in terms of, there's a question from Gerard around um, why is the Victorian government policy called the Recycling Victoria policy? And I think a, a really, well, well, I say my response to that is a key platform of the Victorian policy is to uh, transform and work towards the goal of a recycling service that every Victorian can rely on. And as many of you on the call would be aware, there's been some challenges in the waste and resource recovery sector in, in Victoria. And so that is a key transformation reform of part of the policy is to look at um, uh, that every Victorian has access to uh, a, a four bin service. Um, and there's a key focus in terms of, as you might have seen on TV and radio recently, about reducing contamination in the recycling bin. Um, as the minister said, uh, lots of Victorians want to do the right thing, but don't know what to do and don't have the right information in terms of what should and what should not go in the recycling bin. So I'm going to use that as a bit of a segue to ask the minister, and then I'll ask Katie, is what, what's the role of education and behaviour change in the circular economy? Um, so over to you, Minister, to start with. Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, education is absolutely critical. Uh, people uh, often uh, just in a home understand, you know, what products that they consume, any, any leftovers that might be, you know, how do you recycle, how, how do you... How do you and, and and it can often end up being a very frustrating situation. So, um, and so education is really really critical and and helping Victorians to understand that every decision, every choice they make, can actually contribute to an ongoing problem, uh, or it can actually help to alleviate and be part of the solution. And I think education is really critical uh, to to make those right choices. Uh, and uh, as, I, as I said earlier, uh, Claire, people do want to do the right thing on the whole. Uh, we need to make it easier for them. 
uh, to, to make those choices. Education is also about uh, getting, uh, uh, getting communities to understand more broadly how working together can actually uplift uh, the, the outcomes uh, that they can achieve. Individuals can achieve a lot. Collaboration through community effort, whether it's a community in a local town or whether it's a community in a workplace or a community at home or in a school, can actually give you that extra lift uh, towards getting the outcomes that we want to achieve. And that really just goes to the, the importance of CBIC, uh, bringing together the community of, of businesses and, and industry together uh, through collaboration with uh, research partners and the like uh, to really uh, help to share uh, great experiences, great solutions, but also problems, uh, looking for solutions to come forward so that in its own organic way uh, can actually uh, play a really strong educative role, but also backed by real solutions and potentially, of course, uh, strong funding uh, that has been made available uh, from our government. Thank you, Minister. Um, and food waste is the priority focus area for the first year of CBIC. And I know at Sustainability Victoria, we've run a number of behaviour change campaigns. Uh, one was called Love Food, Hate Waste. And the other one was Love a List, because what we learned through behavioural insights is that you can reduce, significantly reduce food waste if people write a list before they go shopping. <laughs> so I'm interested, Katie, a question for you in terms of you've been actively involved in, you know, thinking about circular food waste and how to eliminate food waste for the last decade in your businesses. Have you seen a change in the Victorian community about understanding that there is a food waste issue or do you think there is, a, what's, what's your um, feeling about it, the role of education? Look, it's, um, I think it's incredibly important. Um, I can talk about it. Obviously, the Minister did a great job of talking about it from a consumer level. Also, you know, if we go further upstream to business, to manufacturers, the people that make and grow our food. The wonderful thing about circular economy is there's so much opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think um, education as far as seeing, seeing waste as an unfortunate necessity of doing business um, that's what we need to change. It's not an unfortunate necessity of doing business. It's actually a massive opportunity. And I can give you an example that springs to mind. Um, and that would be here in Victoria, where we've got some fantastic berry growers. Um, and there's this mindset around wanting to have whole berries. You know, even if they're frozen, we want them whole. Even if we're going to put them in a blender, we want them whole. Why do we want them whole? But as a part of the picking process, you know, a lot of these berries, blue you know they all crumb and there'll be this sort of pulp at the bottom um, and currently the practice of that is most of that goes to waste um, but what we've seen is by putting that onto a platform and giving visibility to it um, a very innovative brewer here has actually used some of those berries in what they deem to be a purple rain beer, which I tasted, it was delicious, <laughs> and used it as an input. So I think the message to business is Wherever you're procuring product, have a look at what is actually available um, from that circular economy principles. And wherever you have a waste output, there is opportunity to move, certainly in the food industry, that product further up. There is definitely opportunity within your business today. It's just a question of having a look. Thank you, Katie. And I'm now, I think there's a question here from Chelsea and I'm gonna ask Veronica this. Do you have examples of radical collaboration? You know that most of the, of the projects that we've done uh, require collaboration because in order to actually close the loop of certain materials, you need to engage different parts. And it's funny because when I talk about the value chains, I tend to do a circle because my mind is circular already, right? But but you have to get all those all those pieces together. So we, what we're doing now, in the precisely in these pre-recycling stations, uh, we are we are starting to pilot uh, the potential clo uh, circularity of certain materials. And for that, we of course need collaboration between different parts of the value chain. So, for example, right now, right today, we. Uh, launched this uh, the, the, this project where 
we are in these recycling stations receiving pizza uh, packaging. And I said, well, it's, it's nothing that uh, innovative, right? But it's a huge deal because the pizza, the pizza packaging, you cannot divert it to recycling because it is actually um, contaminated, but you could do part of it to recycling plants and part of it to composting plants. So we did an alliance between a big uh, pizza chain, I'm not going to say the name, but, or maybe yes, I don't know if you know it, it's Papa Jones. Um, and <laughs> But uh, so we, we, we are working with Papa Jones with one of the biggest composting uh, plants here in Santiago, um, with a retailer, right, where you can, where you have actually set up all these uh, re recycling, like the receiving stations for this uh, recyclable or composting uh, packaging and ourselves and the, uh, the municipality. So you have all those prayers working together in order to somehow make it feasible to that particular product, which is very popular, right? Because the pizza consumption probably ri uh, have risen this latest month uh, in order to <laughs> make, make that loop uh, actually close. Um, so sometimes, something that it's not necessarily super innovative also requires a lot of people together in order to make it happen. If, if we wouldn't have the retailer, it wouldn't be very hard to find this spot where a lot of people could actually bring things and at the same time, and at the same time do other stuff, right? Um, because people normally bring their stuff because they're going to buy something, right? So you, you find the perfect location then you need the municipality because you need the education. You need to broadcast this. You need to communicate it because you can have the perfect solution, but if no one knows, then it doesn't serve a thing. Then you need the either recycling plant or the composting plant because this is not necessarily still very profitable. So you need to gather everyone because there's no value still in all those things. So you need to put all of them together in order to achieve the scale needed to then come up with the value, et cetera. So that is one example. I hope it served. <laughs> Thank you, Veronica. Um, I think I've got a question here. There was a few questions on the screen about infrastructure. So I might ask this question of the minister in terms of uh, in the Recycling Victoria policy, infrastructure is part of the value chain and in terms of um, how uh, the initiatives that are in the current policy in terms of incentives for new infrastructure or new ways of thinking. Uh, yes, thank you, Claire. I mean, infrastructure is really critical. I mean, we, we've touched on a number of issues, but um, certainly infrastructure is one of those areas that we've realised as a state, uh, we need to be not just more uh, uh, front footed if you like, in terms of uh, creating incentives, providing financial support for, for businesses and local governments to establish infrastructure for the op to grow the opportunity to, to, do, to turn materials into higher value products. But it's also where the infrastructure is located is really, really critical. And if we're thinking about the miles travelled for um, materials moving from where the the waste, if you like, is created to where it needs to go to uh, be uh, changed in terms of additional value, then infrastructure is really, really critical here. So, for example, one of the key uh, objectives that we've got as a state is not just, of course, putting significant dollars into improving the infrastructure for sorting uh, and then, of course, reprocessing, but identifying opportunities and enabling local communities, especially in regional Victoria, to do more of that within their own regions. So you're actually taking, you know, trucks and the mileage that comes out of that, out of that and of course, the emissions that, that get generated through, you know, traveling, you know, thousands or kilometers uh, to, to move materials away to more uh, localized solutions. And that includes also helping local economies to, to develop up their own local circular economy uh, policies uh, and, uh, and, and the infrastructure funding uh, will provide a great uplift to that. Uh, so that's something that we're very excited about. 
uh, and uh, we can see already that there's some significant funds uh, and opportunities through programs that are available to get that infrastructure built. Thank you, Minister. Um, I think there's been a common theme throughout this panel discussion around what I would call the circular mindset, which is where there is no waste. Um, and we are only talking about resources in terms of what, what's at the start of the value chain and what's at the end and, and the opportunities for all of those resources to be used. So, so I'm interested, and this is at the heart of CBIC in terms of thinking about design across the whole value chain of, of consumerism, is it, it's not, it has no geographic bias. And I think as the minister said, there is incredible opportunities for local based solutions um, you know, across Victoria. So I'm interested, I'll start with you, Katie. Um, for any business in Victoria that's starting to think about how they could adopt a circular mindset or a circular business model, what, what do you, what's your advice in terms of what's the first step? Well, I think it mirrors what um, all the panelists have said today, which is don't do it alone. You know know find um, people like-minded people that can help you on your journey um, when I think about you know Yumi and our progression we couldn't have done it without the collaboration of government without the collaboration of other businesses without the collaboration of not-for-profits we just simply would not be where we are today so I can't stress the importance of this enough um, you know, when we, we started out, we, we were looking at, we were such a small fish in a very, very big pond, um, looking to escape being eaten by sharks sometimes, you know, and um, we, we partnered with um, one of the largest waste companies in the, in the world, because instead of fighting against them, it's about finding those entrepreneurs in other companies. So that would be my other suggestion. Don't underestimate the power of one person, even in a large company, to create change. In fact, that's the only thing that ever has created change is people with passion wanting to do something differently. You know, we're seeing that with the people talking today. Um, so don't do it alone. Find passionate entrepreneurs and don't give up. Thanks, Katie, so much. That's uh, incredibly helpful. Is it? And it's at the heart of CBIC is really around partnerships, about creating new partnerships. Uh, some people could call it business speed dating but it's trying to find uh, people that you might not know you have a connection with, but through a conversation, you realise there's opportunities to work together. Um, Veronica, over to you. Same question in terms of um, what's your advice in terms of how businesses could, could either start their circular you know, transition or if they're already on it, what sort of are other things that they can think about? Hmm. Thanks, Lear. I couldn't agree more uh, with Katie uh, and super inspirational, right? That is, that is very, very true. I could only add that um, when we're talking about um, circular economy or designing out waste uh, or using better our resources or reducing the impact, we need to start talking about data. And, and for example, that in Latin America is a huge gap that we have we don't necessarily have inform reliable information and data. So what we should do, we should start measuring ourselves and really understand and quantify, okay, look, this is the amount of impact that my product actually generates, right? Uh, and then I can start picking up where to start uh, putting different solutions because if you don't measure things, then it's, a lot of solutions that are very, how do you say, like uh, with, with very good intentions. But then once you realize that what they are actually going to create, sometimes all these good intentions are, are intended to a solution that could even be worse than the previous thing that you have. Because it's, it's a, sometimes it's, it's, it gets very technical. So when you're doing a life cycle analysis and et cetera, you need to gather a lot of information and understand a lot of things before really committing to a more sustainable solution. Um, so don't be afraid of measuring your impact. Probably you, get, you will be surprised of the amount of impact that you generate, but that's not a problem because then you can start solving this data based on science right this is the same thing as with climate change thanks veronica and i am going to have to ask the minister the last question because i know that she loves data and she absolutely loves evidence-based decision making and so just 
Minister, a question for you in terms of the role of data in Recycling Victoria policy. Uh, yes, uh, Claire, Claire is right, thank you. I, I do love data, but uh, data is uh, irrefutable. Uh, data is what uh, enables you to, uh, it, it gives you that, that important foundation for arguing your point of policy design uh, and where in, how investment decisions can be made and where they should be targeted. Yes, I am absolutely a fan of data. For governments that always have scarce resources, businesses have scarce resources, uh, and you need to know and be well informed for the decisions that you make, knowing uh, that they are the best uh, way, that the, the, the be they will get you the best outcome for, for the investment decision that you make. Victoria and all of Australia really have uh, not been served very well for a, a lack of sufficient and, and adequate data in terms of the way materials move right throughout our economy. Uh, and it is about how much is lost, uh, but we can also uh, end up in a situation where we can establish a whole range of really great targets for uh, working towards that drive our investments. Uh, uh, we really uh, can't be absolutely confident that those choices and decisions that are being made uh, are actually working. So one of the key underpinnings of our uh, investment uh, to, to have the, the success of our, our action plan is to ensure that we've got an economy-wide uh, adequate data uh, collection system in place that can be uh, accessed certainly by decision makers, whether they are decision makers in government, whether they are the decision makers in businesses, uh, to so that we can actually understand fully and therefore apply the right solutions based on that data. Data has to drive the investment. It has to drive uh, the... Uh, behaviour change and, and you know one of the worst aspects of uh, uh, where, where sometimes governments or businesses can go wrong is that when they don't have the sufficient data uh, and then things go wrong uh, because they're not used to actually that data isn't used to drive your decision making uh, then you actually have a great risk of losing social license if you lose social license you lose confidence in the community so, uh, so that's absolutely vital. So we'll be requiring through uh, a dedicated uh, legislation uh, that underpins circular economy, is underpinned by circular economy principles, uh, investment dollars, nine and a half million dollars towards modernizing our waste data systems, but also requiring of uh, businesses and the recycling sector, if you like, uh, the production of data uh, to, to, so that we can report against uh, uh, the, the movement of materials through the economy in a way that optimises uh, the, well, understands the opportunities more better, but also optimises the, the solutions and the investment dollars that follow from that. Thank you, Minister. And well, thank you, Minister D'Ambrosio, Veronica and Katie for your time and insights today. It has been an inspiring conversation. Um, as we said at the start of this, it's a, a, a gift for the four of us to have a chat about such an exciting opportunity in terms of transitioning and accelerating our transition to a circular economy. Um, thank you to, to you, our audience. As a wrap up, we've got a third and final poll, um, which will be on the screen in terms of which industry or sector are you involved with? This might organisation, those that you are maybe collaborating with or your field of study. And you can enter more than one um, and um, we'll definitely use this data to drive CBIC in terms of who's engaged with the launch today um, and to follow up sort of going forward. But most importantly, I just wanted to thank you for the gift of time, the gift of your time to share this hour with us this morning. 